Never before have we had such a blessed opportunity to build the more perfect union of our Founders' dreams. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the true genius of America. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. We'll light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. Free at last! Free at last! Thank God Almighty! We are free at last! America, we have come so far. We have seen so much. But there's so much more to do. After General George Washington and his troops won the American Revolutionary War in 1783, the story goes that one of King George III's ministers said to the king, we have to call a peace conference. Now the king had just lost the new world. So King George reportedly said something like this, George Washington will not know how to be king. They will want me back. The assumption was that since Washington had conquered, Washington would be king. But the minister said, I understand he has resigned his office and gone home. And to that, the king replied, if that is true, he will be the greatest man in the world. You see, it has been said that Washington may have been less eloquent than Jefferson, less educated than Madison and Franklin and Hamilton, yet all these looked up to him because they trusted him with power. He abhorred kingship so much, he gave up power twice. Once after he got to the end of the war, he resigned his military commission and went home. And at the end of his second term as the first president of the United States. And this set a precedent for presidents for over 150 years. Washington knew what the founders saw, and that is that the most important thing in the US Constitution was its separation of powers to enable freedom. In 1809, Thomas Jefferson wrote, no provision in our constitution ought to be dearer to man than that which protects the rights of conscience against the enterprises of civil authority. And in 1822, Jefferson went on to also say that the constitutional freedom of religion is the most inalienable and sacred of all human rights. Religious liberty, in fact, was so significant to the United States that the Bible actually talks about it in relation to it as well. I go to Revelation chapter 13 and I notice what the Bible says in verse 1. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. By the way, some manuscripts say he stood on the sand of the sea and that is a reference to the dragon we see in the previous chapter. And I continue. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and on his horns, 10 crowns and on his heads, a blasphemous name. Well, who is this dragon that I said is standing on the sand of the sea? We go to the previous chapter and in Revelation chapter 12, verse nine, there is a very clear identification. The Bible says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. The dragon is Satan. He is the self-made enemy of God. And in the opening of Revelation chapter 12, we see a woman who is about to give birth to a child and this dragon comes and he stands in front of her and he's ready to destroy her child as soon as he's born. It's not hard to know who the child is because in verse five, the Bible says that this child is caught up to God and to his throne. 
this child is Jesus. And historically, we know that Satan tried to destroy Jesus through the ruler of the Roman Empire, Herod. Remember the story. And so the dragon represents Satan, yes, but also the civil power through which he attempted to kill Jesus when he was on this earth. As we continue reading in Revelation chapter 12, incredibly, the child escapes and the woman flees from the dragon into the wilderness for 1,260 prophetic days. That's 1,260 years. Hers is the experience of God's church. We find the reference of a woman in Bible prophecy representing a church, a church being found in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 2. Well, since Satan couldn't destroy Jesus, he continued to work through Roman power to try and destroy his church. As historian A.C. Flick put it, out of the ruins of political Rome arose the great moral empire in the giant form of the Roman church. Historians estimate that between 50 to 150 million people were slaughtered under the sanction of the medieval Roman church. Perhaps this explains why James Madison, who authored much of the U.S. Constitution, Constitution, why he wrote in 1832, in the papal system, government and religion are in a manner consolidated, and that is found to be the worst of governments. You see, because through the church of Rome, Satan was working with dragon-like power to attack God's church, heresy and unbelief in the teachings of the church were considered to be crimes that were worthy of punishment, capital punishment even. I quote, they believe the church may by divine right confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their person and condemn them to flames. The right to inflict the severest penalties, even death, belongs to the church. This was a quote from public ecclesiastical law. And so we see that at the hands of the church, even in the year 1572, the blood of 30,000 Protestants ran through the streets of several cities in France in what came to be known as the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. On this day, the church celebrated this as a victory. Bells rang in the churches from every steeple and a medal was even struck in commemoration. The medieval inquisition carried out un believable cruelty, which Pope John Paul II apologized for in the year 2000 as well. But Revelation 12, 16 also says that the earth helped the woman. Protestants, many of them, escaped to the mountains and Alps of Europe and they fled across the seas to America where they found a haven for religious freedom. And the dragon that we met in Revelation chapter 12 was furious. Why? Because he failed. He lost the war in heaven. Revelation tells us he was kicked out of heaven, cast out of heaven. He, the child escaped. The woman that he's been chasing, she's escaped too. And then in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12, the Bible says, and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Literally, the dragon went away to prepare for a final battle. That's why we find him standing on the sand of the sea in Revelation chapter 13, because he is waiting for two beast allies, two beast buddies to work with him in an epic and dramatic final attack on the woman who just keeps getting away. In Revelation 13 verse 2, we continue. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne and great authority. There is an unmissable link that we just read together right here, an unmissable link here to the beast that we see in Daniel chapter seven. Daniel saw a lion, bear and leopard in that order because he was looking into the future in Daniel chapter seven. But here in Revelation 13, John is looking back and so he sees them in the reverse order. And notice with me how the dragon gives his power to the sea beast. 
The sea beast and the little horn, they seem to do the same things because they describe the same power. Verse three of Revelation 13 says, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed the beast. The power of the sea beast lasted exactly 1,260 years until, as Lyle shared with us, on, in February of 1798, Napoleon's general came and captured the Pope and it brought, as it appeared, the power of the church to an end. It was like a mortal wound for the power of the medieval church that had ruled over Europe and everybody thought it was gone. But in 95 AD, that's when John wrote the book of Revelation, John saw that it would return with more power. Earlier this year, I accidentally chopped the tip of my finger off with a hatchet while on a camping trip with my husband. And uh, I was actually trying to surprise him with my wood chopping skills. I thought, I'll show him that I can chop wood. And he was surprised, but it is the last time that I'm going to chop the wood when we go camping. What amazed us both was actually how well my finger healed. In fact, the fingerprints even returned back to the part of the, my finger that I lost. The Bible says that this power would receive a deadly wound and it heals. So much so that the world doesn't even see the scarring anymore. The sea beast is the dragon's first ally that we find in chapter 13. The dragon's second ally, the earth beast, is very unique. Every beast in Daniel chapter 7 has conquered through war and through war, it conquers the beast power or the kingdom before it. But the earth beast is different because it is the only beast in Bible prophecy that actually helps the previous beast recover its lost power. It's a functional beast, if you will. And as you look at all the characteristics that the Bible gives us of the earth beast, they point us to the United States of America. I read Revelation 13 verse 11. The Bible says, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. That is in a gradual process of time. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. In Revelation, Jesus is called the lamb over and over again. And so we see the first thing here that this is a nation that is Christian like. It has two horns without crowns representing two powers. In Deuteronomy 33 verse 17, the Bible says that horns symbolize power. But these two powers that the beast has, the earth beast has, they are separate from one another. They are a picture of church and state. And the strength of America's Republic is in its separation of church and state. It's a state without a king and a church without a pope. And this very separation was based on the words of Christ himself. Jesus said that we should render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But there's a contradiction in the text because this beast, this lamb-like, Christian-like beast speaks like a dragon. And we've met the dragon before. It means it speaks like Satan. It speaks like the church spoke in the dark ages. And for this very reason, the earth beast does some very strange and sensational things. I read on in verse 12 of Revelation 13. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. The earth beast helps the sea beast recover its lost power and then it leads the whole world to worship this first beast. In order to do that, you have to be some sort of a global superpower to achieve this. And that is exactly what the earth beast is. It is a global superpower. In fact, I quote the Sydney Morning Herald, September 20, 2002. This is what the paper said. Americans should admit the truth and face up to their responsibilities as the undisputed masters of the world. The fact is no country has been as dominant culturally economically, technologically, and militarily in the history of the world since the Roman Empire. I go on. 
it reads in verse 13, he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. This describes a form of government where the legislative power rests with the people. This is yet another clue that points to us that this is the United States in Bible prophecy. He performs great signs, the Bible says. And I think of a Bible story of Elijah. In the story of Elijah, fire came from heaven to show who was the true God. But at the end of time, signs aren't always indicators of truth. Jesus even warned his followers in Matthew chapter 24 that false Christs and false prophets would show great signs and wonders to deceive people at the end of time. And these signs, the Bible says, they lead to the making of an image to the beast. Now, when we look in a mirror, we see an image of ourselves. That is, we see our likeness. To see what the image of the beast will be like, we simply have to look at what the beast is like because the earth beast will form an alliance and copy the sea beast. And by the way, in the Ten Commandments, the second commandment of God forbids the worship of images because all worship belongs to God. But something with the likeness of the medieval church state system will be formed in America. In Revelation 13 and verse 5, the sea beast, the Bible says, speaks blasphemies. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is when a created being claims to be God. And since nations speak through their legislative and judicial authorities, when America assumes the prerogatives of God and passing laws and passes laws that remove individual rights and the ability to follow conscience, you can expect that it will develop a spirit of intolerance and it will persecute like Rome. Thus, America will speak like a dragon, like Rome. But to do this, it would require the reversal of the First Amendment of its constitution, which safeguards the freedom and practice of religion. The Constitution of the United States, as we have already seen, is built on beautiful Christian principles. The Apostolic Church originally kept the things of church and state separate. But during the Middle Ages, the church changed this. Pope Pius IX in 1854, he called the defense of liberty of conscience a most pestilential error. He called it a pest of all others most to be dreaded in a state. Well, Revelation 13 verse 15 continues and I read, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. John wrote of a coming global edict about worship way back in 95 AD. He said that the earth beast will use its authority to enforce the observance of something at the end of time as an act of worship or homage to the medieval church. Revelation 13 goes on to call this something the mark of the beast. And there are two stories in the book of Daniel that bring this end time scenario into focus for us. In Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar, the civil ruler of Babylon, he sets up a golden image, a giant golden image, and he commands everyone everywhere to worship it. This was a violation of the first clause of the First Amendment, if you will, the United States Constitution. It reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Was Nebuchadnezzar overstepping his jurisdiction as king when he did this? He absolutely was. He had the executive right to legislate in civil matters, but no right to command worship. And the immediate result was persecution. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were three young men, model citizens. They were Hebrews and they had obeyed the civil laws of Babylon. They even prayed for the king. But when the king of Babylon overstepped his bounds, legislating worship, 
Three young men practiced civil disobedience because as Acts 5, 29 says, the Bible says we ought to obey God rather than men. God intervened and saved the young men from the fiery furnace and God, had he not helped them, they would have perished. In Daniel chapter 6, we see the violation of the second clause of the First Amendment illustrated. This states in the U.S. Constitution that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That is, the government can't prohibit you from practicing your religion and it can't establish a religion and tell you how to worship. In chapter 6 of the book of Daniel, King Darius made a law based on counsel from his advisors that no one could pray to any God but the king for 30 days. He was prohibiting the free exercise of religion. But Daniel didn't stop his practice of worshiping God. He opened his windows and continued to pray to God. Persecution followed. Daniel was arrested and the king, who actually liked Daniel, he tried in vain to deliver him to, through finding a legal loophole, but the law couldn't be changed. And so again, God intervened, saved Daniel from the lion's den. John the Baptist too, he was, th he was thrown into prison for telling King Herod that it was immoral of him to take his brother's wife. Herodias hated John the Baptist for this. And she thought to herself, how can I get rid of this man? One night, her daughter Salome, who was the image of her mother, she danced for Herod at a drunken party and she so pleased him that he said she could have whatever she wanted. Her mother, said to her, request the head of John the Baptist. In Revelation 17, the sea beast is pictured as a harlot woman riding on a beast called the mother of harlots. Meaning as a mother, she has daughters who do what she says. The harlot of Revelation 17, it represents the medieval church that has been unfaithful to the teachings of the Bible. And her daughters, the modest, modern Protestant churches will follow in the steps of their mother. Today, Protestantism has sadly lost its way. You can study the compromises it has made in favor of Rome. Go on the internet and Google it. The Bible predicts that modern Protestants and modern Catholics will join hands. Church and government will come together again and it will come together in the United States. America is the country that led the world from tyranny to liberty and it will lead the way back. The worst persecution always happens when church and state get together. Again, this is all over the internet. You can look at it on history. An alliance between church and government led to the crucifixion of Christ. Just like in the times of Jesus, the religious leaders back then, they said in John 11 verse 50, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. People will say, this is Christian to do this. This is patriotic and we need to do this for the land of the free and home of the brave. And if history proves right, then legislators in the United States will one day repeat the same mistake that Pontius Pilate made in the crucifixion of Jesus. In order to gain popularity, they will condemn innocent people. Christ's enemy wasn't the state. It was the religious leaders who were jealous of him. The religious leaders influenced the state power to kill their public enemy number one. This is really serious stuff. But is it really possible that the United States of America, this bastion of freedom in our world, is it really possible that it could one day violate its own constitution? Could it really act contrary to this beautiful constitution that has been so carefully balanced to prevent tyranny ever happening again? You might say, well, Sharissa, this will never happen in America. But we could have said that last year about a lot of things this year. It sounds insane, but the Bible says it will happen. And in times of severe crisis, natural disasters, collapsing economy, crime, Nations do strange things that are out of character. When we forget history, we are doomed to repeat the errors of history. 
at the Federalist Convention in 1787, a lady asked Dr. Benjamin Franklin, well, doctor, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? A republic, he replied, if you can keep it. The Founding Fathers knew the importance of educating its citizens, their citizens, on history, which is why Samuel Adams wrote in a letter dated February 12, 1779, if virtue and knowledge are diffused among the people, they will never be enslaved. This will be their greatest security. But year after year has gone by, and we have found ourselves further and further from the past and things change. In 1903, Pope Leo XIII, he said of the Middle Ages, then church and state were happily united, end quote. But we look at history and we see the result of the union of church and state was persecution and death. In 1913, the following quotation appeared in Protestant magazine. It was a quotation from the Catholic Standard and Times of 1894. I quote, the United States of America, it can be said without exaggeration, are the chief thought of Leo XIII. A few days ago, receiving an eminent American, Leo XIII said, quote, the United States are the future. We think of them incessantly. In fact, in more recent times, Lutherans and Catholics who historically have had huge differences on how a person is saved. They signed a joint declaration of faith in 1999, basically saying, we agree. For 180 years, the makeup even of the Supreme Court in the United States was predominantly Protestants of European descent not because of any hatred towards Catholics or others, but just simply because they desired to see diversity represented in the court and to ensure that they avoided the tyranny they had all fled in Europe. Today, this balance in the Supreme Court has also shifted. In fact, today people are fascinated by the modern Catholic Church because it fights for human rights, for morality, for marriage, it's pro-life and it's for religious freedom. And these are wonderful things. But I ask you, if the beliefs that enabled her actions in history have not changed, has she really changed? If the teachings are the same, it means that she is still capable of what she did in the past, does it not? The Bible predicts that at the end of time, the United States is going to join forces with fallen religion to create a system similar to that which we saw in the Dark Ages. And whenever religious people use the government to mandate things about worship, it's unchristian. Mandating prayer, putting God on our money, it doesn't make people moral. Governments cannot make us moral. Morality comes from loving God and obeying His law of freedom. In 1856, Abraham Lincoln said, don't interfere with anything in the Constitution. That must be maintained, for it is the only safeguard of our liberties. You see, he recognized the ideas of the Constitution were timeless. And the founders of America wisely sought to guard against the use of civil power by the church, since it always leads to persecution. Madison, the author of the Constitution, he cautioned American citizens not to give Caesar what belongs to God and joining together what God has put asunder. He said the Constitution of the U.S. forbids everything like an establishment of a national religion. The national anthem says, Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? America is built on Christian principles. But is its constitution crumbling? In 2020, our world has been united by a common enemy, COVID-19. Civilization has been brought almost to a grinding halt by a microscopic parasite 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. In order to secure its citizens, Americans have had to accept several violations of their prized liberty, the right to assemble, freedom of speech, religious liberty, and national emergencies like World War II and 9-11, they have always done this and people have been willing to do this for the sake of the common good. The question is, after the threat subsides, will America recognize these constitutional violations or could they become the new normal? Regardless of what happens, the United States is headed precisely where prophecy predicted. And we know the script, 
This will happen, make no mistake. No matter how hard the dragon might try, in the end, God and liberty will triumph. How do I know that? Because Revelation 13 is not the end of the book. I'm so glad that you were able to join us for this presentation as part of our nine-part series on America and the end. But there is so much more that the Bible has to say about today and the times that we are living in. So if you would like to know more about what the Bible says about this subject and today, then we want to invite you to connect with us. There's a number on the screen. Please call or text us on this number. If you would like some Bible study guides that will help you to understand more about what God's Word says about today, or perhaps you would even like someone to personally study the Bible with you. That is something we would love to help you with. So please don't hesitate. Call or text us today. We look forward to hearing from you.